Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Skills in Demand, Uncovering the Common Skills for High-Paying, High-Growth Jobs of the Near Future, sponsored by Microsoft. We're very happy to have today's speakers, Cushing Anderson from IDC and Edwin Guarin from Microsoft. Cushing Anderson is Program Vice President for IDC's Project-Based Re Services Research. In this role, Mr. Anderson is responsible for managing the research agenda, field research, and custom research projects for IDC. Previously, he was also distinguished as Analyst of the Year by IDC clients and as one of the top 20 people to watch in corporate training by Lifelong Learning Market Report for his work with business consulting, human resources, and learning research programs. Edwin Guarin is a business productivity, productivity solution specialist at Microsoft for education in the Northeast, as well as a current faculty member at Harvard University Division of Continuing Education. He is a highly sought out keynote speaker at many education focused conferences across the country, including those for Sengage, Pearson Education, CBEA, and MBEA. Edwin also recently won the Boston Private Industry Council Achiever Award for inspiring Boston public school students by providing access to cutting-edge technology resources and opportunities that advance their academic and career aspirations. Before I pass things off, I'd like to mention two quick things. If at any time during the presentation you have questions, please post them in the Q&A panel on the lower right-hand side of your screen. You are also encouraged to tweet your questions and comments to our speakers. Cushing's Twitter handle is at C-U-S-H-I-N-G-A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And Edwin's Twitter handle is at E-D-V-A-N-G-E-L-I-S-T. Lastly, please be on the lookout for a follow-up email with a copy of the slides and a link to the archive to review and share with colleagues. Now, I'd like to pass things off to Cushing. Thanks very much. I'd like to take the, uh, the opportunity to thank Edwin for joining me today, too. Uh, he's got some great insights and will provide some uh, great anecdotes and examples as we progress through the slide. So you'll hear Edwin jump in occasionally. He's the other voice that you'll hear. Um, as, as was mentioned, I'm a, I'm a researcher. I typically focus on corporate education and was recently asked to look at um, the kinds of skills that employers were going to be looking for to help employers better market and better identify and, and recruit the kinds of skills that were going to be important going forward. And then when I looked at that data, I recognized that it had some value to the education community, so we looked at it this way and we have repackaged it in such a way that to help the education community kind of get a sense for at least what employers are going to be looking for, and hopefully it will help inform some of the the work that you folks do around building curricula and helping prepare students for future work. Now, I wanted to start off, I always like to try and start off with describing kind of why I'm here and where my research bias comes from. The first thing I want to point out is that I've here, and I'm sure you hear these things too, you being very close to, to students and the school issues and school curricula issues that are happening around, there, there is a, what I consider to be an unsettling kind of discussion around does college really matter and can can folks become quite successful without going to college? Well, does it matter for everyone, or is it just for the exceptional few um, that it matters for? And I find that to be an unsettling question, but a lot of that comes down to questions of relevance, and are we making both high school and college relevant to the future needs of our, of our, of our students and our kids? And we also, that kind of leads you to the, what's the purpose of school, and then what should be taught? All of those things are very interesting questions. I have a master's degree in education, though I do not consider myself uh, an education expert, um, I do uh, like thinking about these things. But I come at this with a research bias, a particular research bias. Um, and my research bias comes from, a, uh, from an, an effort and an intent to really help everyone realize their full potential. And that means providing an equal opportunity to succeed for everyone. Um, and the goal of this particular research is to inform a dialogue about the element, elements of a responsible curriculum. I don't know what that is. I don't know how to mix that with all the other competing priorities that they are. But this just should be one component to the discussion around what creates a responsible curriculum. And the key for me is to ground whatever decisions are made about curriculum and instruction and about student development and student expectations really should all be grounded in real world opportunities. What jobs will be in demand when current students are ready to work? And those students can be in high school now, they can be in 
uh, middle school or, or elementary school, all of that, what, what skills, jobs, and life experiences will those students be living in? And so what kinds of things should we be preparing them to do? And that's how I framed this research, and I hope that's what you'll get out of this, is you'll see that that's really the intention of this whole presentation. So as an agenda, I'm going to quickly go through these kinds of things. We're going to talk a little bit about the changing employment landscape and what that implies for tomorrow's best jobs. And then I'll go through some of the research that we did to identify the skill requirements for today and tomorrow. And really what it's going to focus on, the meat of the presentation talks about the top skills related to what we're describing as high growth, high pay positions. And then once you see those skills, you realize that those are the same skills that are generally relevant for all skills across all kinds of positions. And that's useful to know that you're not going to be biasing or segmenting um, students in any way. And then we're going to dig into those skills a little bit. And it describes two, kind, two big sets of cross-functional skills, which is really what we're going to spend most of our time talking about, those skills that are generally applicable across a wide range of occupations, and specific set of those called communication, integration, and presentation skills. It's a smaller set that we've, discuss, we've discovered is particularly valuable and particularly pervasive in the jobs and skills that we need in the future, and specifically relevant toward those high growth, high pay positions. And then we'll do some wrap up stuff at the end. And as we go, Edwin, as I mentioned, Edwin's going to jump in with some examples of the work that he's done with school districts and colleges uh, and community colleges around the country to help kind of illustrate some of the points that I end up talking about. So I'm going to just jump right in and talk about this changing employment landscape a little bit. Um, in, in 2004, a nonprofit group called Achieve Incorporated um, released a report called Ready or Not, Creating a High School Diploma That Counts. And it described that both employers and colleges expect a higher level of competence from high school graduates than they had in the past. And the report described that current high school exit expectations really fell short of what employers and colleges demanded. The report recommended that states, State Department of Education, um, school districts, and colleges really act, anchor academic standards in the real world. Ten years later, the debate remains regarding the relevance and the aspiration of school requirements. And with the employment landscape changing both in the United States and around the world, the situation of relevance and value does not appear to be getting any clearer. There are several megatrends around the relationship between employers and employees that I think is going to also influence the kinds of, the kinds of skills we want to give to our, into our students. And I'm going to talk about those in a, little bit, in a little bit of detail. There's going to be one of the things that's, that's interesting about um, the changing relationship in employers and what employers demand is really a big one. There's an increasingly diverse customer base both in the United States and around the world, the economy and the economic environment we're in is becoming more diverse. Immigration and demographic changes and ethnic and cultural diversity are really shifting economic power from where they used to be in the past. And it's clear that goods and services will increasingly cater to specific interests, specific values and beliefs and lifestyles. And that requires both the employer and the employee and the products and services that they're selling and the ways in which they engage it will require a recognition and a sensitivity to the alignment and the misalignment of products and services. That's going to be changing. That's going to require a different kind of employee. It's going to require a different kind of student. And we as consumers, as participants in the economic environment, are going to see the relationship between the places that we go and, act and become active citizens. Those people will be interacting with us in a different way. And that's good for us. Another trend has to do with the relationship between the employee and the employer. Many trends are going to be talking about this relationship between employer and employee. And it really changes, it talks about a decline in the paternalistic employer. It will in, probably, we expect to see, as I see in the research that we do, we expect to see an increased use of contingent and part time workers or temporary workers, an increased use of remote workers or telecommuters an increased use of outsourced workers, subcontractors, or what's sometimes called the value-added supply chain. And that will all move non-core work out of the enterprise to more specialized providers. That changes the relationship between the employee and the employer and requires the employee 
to constantly remain increasingly valuable to that employer, both to the direct manager, but also to the, to the engagement and the enterprise at large, or risk being of kind of uh, devalued and possibly shifted to another, another organization. We're also going to see um, we're also going to see an increased complexity in the, in the enterprises. Mergers and regulatory requirements, globalization, sometimes we might even consider it the faster corporate boom and bust cycles are creating enterprises that are not only more flexible and arguably more nimble, but they're also increasingly interdependent and complex. And in some might, some might even regard them as even being temporal. They don't last as long. The, the successful firms now come and go more quickly. And all of those things really are going to require an employee who is more nimble, who knows how to navigate those kinds of uh, both the changes in their employee in their employment status, but also be able to again remain um, relevant to a more complex kind of organization. And the slide that I briefly foreshadowed just a moment ago: um, the expanding mobile customers and increased use of electronic communications. You've seen this all. It's all about mobile communication, about the, the handhelds and the mobile devices that we have, and maybe mobile commerce. We'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of seconds. But, it's, but the whole use of mobile customers is causing a changing relationship between the employee and the customer that they deal with. It often creates opportunities for direct relationship between customers and employees. And that's going to change what the re employer requires in the kinds of employees they expect those that can have the right kinds of engagement, the right kinds of dialogue, um, not only face-to-face, -face, but also remotely. Those are the kinds of expectations that we, we expect to see um, more and more from our employees. And there's also going to be an increased economic importance of digital commerce and digital content. I've alluded to this in a couple of places. The digitization of both routine and creative white-collar work not only has a direct impact on the nature of employees and their work, but also will indirectly and profoundly increase the importance and relevance of more flexible organizational systems. When you start thinking about digital commerce and digital content, it's easy to see how people can work from different locations and still provide high value experiences with possibly uh, less direct contact with their boss or less direct contact with their uh, work colleagues but maybe increase connectivity with their employee, with their, um, with their customers or with the, the people that they um, work in the extended enterprise. All of these things are going to change that relationship between the employer, the employee, and the nature of work. And finally, IT in the workplace. A small, though growing number of workers are purely focused on technology in the workplace. But technology is making its way into an increasing number of jobs that are not always IT focused. And this might be logistics and inventory with handheld devices that, that, keep, that conduct record keeping or quality assurance. Even manual labor or measuring and designing and fabricating items is becoming increasingly tech enabled. Medical and auto and appliance repair um, positions are all, all use technology for monitoring, diagnosing, and record keeping. Even hospitality and food service use technologies for inventory, customer service, and schedule. The technologies that are used in each of those examples are also supported by an IT infrastructure that will be increasingly important to the global economy. But technology is not a driver of employer-employee relationships. Some of these trends are precip precipitated or facilitated by technology. The impact or response of these trends is not, for the most part, technology-focused. And the impact on skills will certainly not be predominantly or even significantly technology related. I'll talk about that in a little while. The skills that students need are not predominantly technical. The skill sets that high school graduates must offer employers must span a wide range of organizational needs. Moreover, these trends don't seem to suggest a strong need to teach technology to be readily employable. The goal isn't to be good at technology. As, as well as some others. It, it's more to be good at other things, and we'll talk about those in a couple of slides. To best forecast what the skills are for tomorrow's best jobs, we want to anchor those standards in the real world and examine the set of common core skills across a, an empl the, employment, the employment spectrum that will be important when children are 
who are now in high school, middle school, and grade school begin to work, whether that's in 2020 or beyond. Once those skills are identified, we must demonstrate that they're relevant not simply to the average job in 2020, but equally valuable to those students who aspire to occupations with above average demand and above average expectations. This assures stakeholders, whether they're educators, policymakers, or parents, that the skill requirements identified will be relevant to the most motivated, ambitious, and conscientious students, in addition to those, probably like me, with more modest aspirations. Tomorrow's best jobs, really, to understand the skills that will be required for these, what we're calling these high growth, high pay positions in the future, we first sought to understand what those jobs are expected to be. To forecast the best jobs in 2020, IDC leveraged data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor, St Labor Statistics. We analyzed employment data from 748 standard occupational classifications and ultimately selected the most attractive classifications and job positions according to three criteria. First, size. To qualify, the occupations had to have at least 100,000 jobs in 2010. Second was growth. The occupation should grow by at least 100,000 jobs by 2020, or if it grows by fewer than 100,000 positions, then it needs to have exhibited 15% of its the growth from 15% of its from its 2000 level. Categories were eliminated if they did not have at least 10% forecast. We did sneak in some that were between 10 and 15% growth because they seem to have particularly um, high salary, or because they seem to have particularly good growth patterns. And then finally wages. The occupation needed to have an average wage above the U.S. median wage. What that resulted was about 60 occupations across 19 different categories. And those jobs are, are kind of important, and they represent a really good set of positions. And we think this is a useful table to illustrate the value of these particular positions. They are high growth and high pay. The 60 occupations we chose had an employment in 2010 of about 28 million people. But between 2010 and 2020, so in that 10-year span, they'll have new job openings, um, new postings, new job openings of about um, 54 million positions. That includes turnover and replacement in, in addition to job growth. Job growth in employment between 2010 and 2020 will be about um, 5.6 or 5.7 million. And that's a 22% growth in employment. That's a really important important number. But what's also important here is the average rate wage. It's about $70,000 in 2010 compared to about forty-five dollars or $46,000 for all occupations uh, that we looked at. So that just shows off kind of the, the kinds of positions. What we're calling, you might hear me talk about this target positions, but they are high growth, high pay positions. And where they come from, um, they come in a bunch of different groups. Remember I mentioned that there were about 19 different categories. And you can see them here. There are a total of about 33.6 million positions. Medical support represents about 14%. Doctors, surgeons, and other kinds of, uh, of medical professionals um, represent another 5%, and they're listed in the other category. Sales and marketing and education and teaching um, each represent about 10% of, of uh, positions. And you can see computer programmers and specialists also reported a bit less than 10% um, uh, of positions, and they're also in this wedge. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the specific positions. Um, uh, the research that we did has them listed, and I'm happy to share that. But what we want to talk about now is kind of the value of these positions and then aim at those skill requirements. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is really kind of getting into those, those specific skills. Um, all of that is just to highlight that we were looking at good positions, good growth, good salaries, worthwhile positions. What we did next was look at the skills and competencies required to be hired into those positions. To determine those skills, we examined about 14.6 million job postings between April and September of 2013, about a year ago. From about 25,000 different job boards and staffing companies' corporate websites. It was supplied by a company called Wanted Analytics who does some really interesting stuff with job postings. But we used that almost 15 million job postings to, to get a real-time um, look at the kinds of skills that employers were looking for in those jobs. 
this sample represents about 80% of all the jobs posted during that period. That 15 million jobs was about 80% of all the jobs that were posted last year during that time. What we see, our analysis uncovered kind of a really interesting trend. You can see that here. Now, this is a geeky chart, and I love geeky charts. But basically, what this is showing off is the, the, uh, the bars, whether they're maroon or blue, are showing off the, um, the per percent of positions that required each skill. Each one of these little bars across the bottom is a different skill. There were about 12, oh, geez, what's the number? Um, more, than a, more than a thousand skills, maybe about um, uh, 1,100 or so skills total that we found. <coughs> Excuse me. And of those 11, 1,100 skills, about, <clears throat> about 37 of them we consider to be cross-functional skills. Excuse me. About, about 37 of those were about cross-functional skills, and those represented about 46% of the skill requirements. <laughs> what we found then is that all the rest of the skills, these blue bars, are occupation-specific skills. What occupation-specific skills do are, they're more, you can see that they end up being relevant to a fewer number of positions across all of this set. And you can see the little yellow lining, another chart, is the number of occupations that cite that particular skill. And the occupations are listed on the right-hand side. All of this is based on the wanted analytics data, and I wanted to show you kind of how we got to these cross-functional skills. They were the ones that were more consistently required by a wider number of positions and occupations. What, we re what it resulted was that the top skills were, f were easily identifiable, easy to pick out. Our, our analysis uncovered um, a really interesting set of skills. We examined the 100 most frequently required skills for each of the positions in the high growth, high salary list, as well as the top 100 skills across all US occupations. And the top skills required are shown here. The most required skills were, were clearly oral and written communication skills, things like attention, and even including attention to detail, customer service focus, organizational skills, and problem solving skills. The only technical skill are things like Microsoft Office and its components, but not probably not because they are technically required, but because they facilitate some of these others. This set of 20 skills represents the most common core skills a labor force can attain. This set is more important than any specific technology skills, deep science or math, even great business skills. This set represents the skills that are most important most, most important and widely required across positions. And those skills are often considered soft skills, but these technologies are, uh, some technologies are also important because they're widely required capabilities across a broad range of occupations. Hey, Christian, I, I'd love to provide an example of, you know, you, you kind of mentioned Microsoft Office really wasn't a, a, a considered a, an actual required skill, but it helps facilitate all the others. I see bilingual, multilingual there. Um, yep. There's a <clears throat> there's a uh, professor. His name is Gino Sorsinelli, and he teaches a uh, UMass Amherst course called Effective Decision Making in the Age of Cloud Computing. Um, students there work together with overseas students in Ireland, Egypt, and Russia, Taiwan to come in the fall. So basically, what they're trying to do is give students not only the ability to collaborate with you know cloud tools but also to understand how to work in groups online across cultures, all valuable skills in an increasingly global business climate. So plus while all the teams speak English, there's still a language barrier because English is not the first language in the Russian and Egyptian teams. So there's a student um, you know, I spoke with, he explained that when you work across cultures like that, he grew up in Singapore, so he's used to, some, uh, used to it to some extent, but you have to drop the cultural assumptions about what people will understand and make clear points. You can't use a lot of colloquialisms. Um, <clears throat> and he believed that by you know, working across teams, uh, especially with uh, different language barriers, um, uh, he believes that this will help him when he goes out into the work world and he has the ability to be more clear and concise in his meetings. Um, he used 
<clears throat> that course basically used, um, you know, something called Office 365, but the, the real point is it had storage space in the cloud for file sharing and collaboration. They had tools for video recording and audio conference calls uh, with peers in other countries so they could work across different time zones. And um, one another student mentioned to me that group video calls made it much more personal to them because if you're communicating with, you know, maybe students in different countries across email, sure, maybe, you know, they're on LinkedIn, you can see their picture, but to be able to interact with them uh, through these audio, video, and file sharing, um, you know, ways uh, has definitely given new ways to manipulate, uh, or I'm sorry, new ways to collaborate in such an effective manner, which I think really uses all these things like time management, uh, the dependability, the ability to work with, um, you know, in a bilingual, multilingual um, <clears throat> culture, and as, as well as problem solving and, and planning. So I, I think, you know, that course is a great example of how it epitomizes everything that you see on this slide. Sorry. <clears throat> no, that's excellent. Thanks, Edwin. My, uh, my horse in my throat or frog in my throat is catchy, and I'm sorry for that. Um, so you're, exactly, <laughs> you're exactly right. The key here is that these skills um, probably aren't going to be the thing you, that, are, that, are, that, is, that are taught, but they are the secondary skills that are required competencies that, that, that students should be attaining as they, and, and to an increasing degree of, of competence as they pass through their high school experience and into their college experience. And having the tools that facilitate that, that certainly don't get in the way of that, but allow people to, to connect in that in the what is as we talked about in the mega trends, it is more likely to be that kind of communication environment and be and be facile in that is really what matters. And that's what we're aiming that the, the purpose of this research is to aim students at those kinds of competencies. And I'm I completely agree, Edwin, that was a big help. Thank you very much for jumping in there. Back in the agenda slide, I talked about how we identify these top skills, but then we compare these top skills to, uh, for these high growth, high pay positions, to the skills for, that are required for all positions. There seems to be, and this happens to be the top 20 skills for all positions, and you can see on the chart um, how it shows off the percentage of, of all positions that required these plus the percentage of target positions that required these. And you can see that these skills um, the, the now the, the list that we see here has a fairly close alignment um, in the applicability of these skills to um, to all positions. Customer service and bilingualism is a little bit lower in the kind of not high growth, high pay positions, but office rates slightly higher and word rates slightly lower. I'm not exactly sure what the what, how how significant those particular movements are, but you'll also see that on this list, Linux which is a, an open source programming language, uh, appears on the list as the mo one of the most, the, the next most frequent technology competence. And it's down in the kind of a very low percentage of positions that, are, are, uh, uh, that, uh, that require it. But I just wanted to point out that there are some technical things that will start drifting in to these requirements when you start looking at all, all positions. Uh, what this gets us to now when we start talking about what we want to talk about now are the difference across functional skills and SIP skills, communication, integration, and presentation skills. And folks that have been around education for a while um, and have been around have been talking about what, what uh, about curriculum, curriculum and curriculum matters and how curricula evolve, we'll, have, we'll see these kinds of skills coming and talked about uh, more and more. As a matter of fact, I was just reading a piece in, in an education uh, magazine this morning uh, about some researcher that's identified what they consider to be the common school, the common skills related to in, uh, folks that are coming right out of college, right out of uh, college and into work now, um, which is a very similar list to what we've done about pres pres positioning this stuff for the future. So I don't expect this list to be much different than what you might have already seen. But what we're talking about when we talk about cross-functional skills. We're talking about 40 skills that appear in the highest percentage of positions and specific postings. So when we looked at all of the job postings and the specific skills required for each of those 15 million positions, these are the 40 skills that appear most often. When we examined those, we discovered there's a subset of about 17 skills that appear to be closely aligned with school curriculum. We call those SIPs. And in some cases, you might want to call SIPs the skills formerly known as business skills. Business skill, I spent a lot of time researching the skills required in an enterprise, in a, in a business, and business skills include presentation skills and communication skills, um, things like that. 
but SIPs are really um, the an advanced version of that, but they're also a more fundamental version of that. They are the kinds of skills that that uh, students need in order to do a wide variety of things. And that's why I like the concept of SIP skills and this research, because it starts talking about the fundamental and foundational knowledge that prepares kids for really good jobs and good successful lives. SIPs really broadly defined as the competencies to seek, evaluate, and examine information and data, and to create reasoned positions, present findings, and make a case for or advocate for whatever position they've come up with. Now, clearly, it's also make a case against positions, but I'm going to try to be a positive guy in these cases. There are three basic categories of SIP skills. Communication, which includes being able to listen, read, and write to uncover agreement and misunderstanding, to seek information and evaluate sources, to identify discrepancies in motivation and bias. And that communication is deep communication. It's not just the ability to talk, but it's the ability to understand the other person. We're going right back to what Edwin was talking about, the ability to really hear the intent of someone you're communicating with who might come with a different set of cultural references or even comes with a different point of view, a different set of, of, of values, they're going to be expressing things in a different way. That's a deeper kind of communication than just being able to listen to the words. Then integration is second in this context. Integration means the ability to weigh relevance, to interpret, to extrapolate, to interpolate, analyze, evaluate, and decide based on principles and information. That is a kind of a make that knowledge that you've gained in the communication part of your being. And I, and I don't mean to make it sound philosophical, but there is that, there's the ability to actually integrate that into the, into the story that you're trying to tell. And then turn that around and present, meaning develop and present a reasoned and persuasive position, articulate strengths and weaknesses, and incorporate feedback to improve both logic and persuasiveness. Presentation is about that ability to articulate the newly integrated stuff, not the, not the mechanics of talking and listening, but the, the presentation of that newly integrated material. And this is not a particularly complicated set of things. You've probably heard people talk about these before, and I don't mean to make them sound as if they're particularly unique, but they seem to fit together so well out of this research that I wanted to bring them up. Hey, Here's Christian, a I'd love to yeah. provide um, you know, an, another example of actually what, what you just discussed. Um, there is a middle school in the uh, Northwest, um, a private middle school, and in the math class, students pair up to use their tablets as they measure items around campus. And with their wireless access throughout the school's campus, students can take their tablets with them, record their measurements in OneNote, video record each other, explaining how to convert measurements from meters to centimeters, et cetera. And the teacher mentioned that um, she'll be able to go in later to see if they really understand the concept by their explanations uh, through their videos, which was shared with them. So in addition to learning the math activity, uh, in a dynamic and interactive way, they're learning to craft digital presentations at a young age. So it really goes to, you know, that part of communication and presentation where they're trying to, you know, not only do what they do in the math class, but be able to um, <clears throat> extrapolate and be able to explain that information and in integrating all the, the data that they're collecting. So um, again, you know, it just, it, it, we, we're starting to really see this type of integration and new ways of learning um, in, in schools across the country. <clears throat> and that's a great, great example. And the other interesting thing about that is that that's what a lot of ha what happens in a lot of the workplaces too. It's about kind of seeking information, integrating it, and then making a presentation in the other way. And now you're not going to have a teacher when you when, when, when our students are out in the work world, but they are going to have people who have to con have to understand that material. And, and the better they are prepared to do that because they've practiced it, they've 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 been given those tools, they've been given that experience. That's what's going to make them successful as we kind of move on into other portions of our of our work life. Completely Thank agree. Thank you. Um, IDC found that the SIP-related skills are required for about 40% of all job postings, and about 70% 70, 70 of positions that require at least one of the top 20 skills also require a SIP skill. So they are widely and commonly um, available. And we want to show off, too, this list of tables that I, was, that I flashed up a moment ago. These are not particularly skills that you need to, again, you don't need to teach these. There shouldn't be a class in problem solving, though I think it's kind of a cool thing. What we're talking about here are these are the kind of secondary skills that, that, um, that lessons should kind of articulate and bring forward and, and support. 
and the scaffolding that happens around these skills as, as we see our kids progress from less competent to, to more advanced capabilities in these areas. Some of them are kind of basic data entry, it's just a detail-oriented uh, ex expression. But honestly, it's something that I needed to learn as a 30-year-old, as, a as I work, started working in a job that required really um, precise data entry. I was not a particularly focused on the value of being precise. And it took a little while to understand that there was some accuracy required, especially because I was an auditor at the time. And I really needed to be better at, those, at, the, at the data entry. Um, we talked about the wide relevance of, of SIP skills. Um, we found that SIP skills are required in about 40% of all postings, certainly about only about 39% of those fastest growing and high pay positions, and about 70% of positions that require at least one of those top 20 skills. And we found that SIP skills make up 11 of the top 20 skills required in all those positions. And that's really important. It suggests that these are very valuable downstream. Now, technologies. Uh, specific technologies are also enablers of these critical communication, integration, and presentation skills. And so things like Microsoft Office and other non-Microsoft software, you'll see kind of involved in um, both in the SIPs-related uh, list, but also in the requirements. But you can see here, Microsoft Office is required competence almost twice as office, uh, often as non-Microsoft software. And that's, that just shows that the pervasiveness of Microsoft in the workplace. And the other angle on this is that one of the things that Edwin had mentioned earlier about the uh, multicultural uh, collaboration that, that he was observing was the idea that it's the tool, these are the kinds of tools that are commonly available in the marketplace. And so those are the kinds of skills that the students are going to be asked to demonstrate as they enter the workplace. Hey, Cushing, you know, um, I'm, I'm kind of, I would be interested in hearing more uh, or, you know, maybe trying to find a study out there about certifications. A lot of those SIP skills, you know, have some type of related certifications to it. There have been studies done that, uh, that show that 91% of hiring managers consider employee certification as a criterion for hiring. 89% of supervisors say that uh, office uh, certified employees are more proficient users of office programs. And 79% of hiring managers feel that certified individuals are more efficient. Um, there are a couple of school, or actually states, in the U.S. that are really understanding that and trying to make sure that they leverage technology, especially, say, office certifications in the classroom um, in order to make their students, um, you know, better potentially hired employees. So, for example, in North Carolina, <clears throat> you know, there's this uh, program out there which helps teachers certify themselves and students in, in MOS, that Microsoft Office Specialist uh, certifications. The first year they piloted, they only had 21 MOS certifications between teachers and students. That, that after the first full year, they had 8,700. The second year, 43,000. And then the third year of this program is 53,000 um, total certifications for students and, um, um, and teachers and faculty. And we took that a little further, and in Florida, um, there's a, a, a school called Cape Academy program where they also decided to implement, you know, helping these students become certified. And what they found is um, for the non-certified students, um, the GPA was 2.6. For the certificated, uh, certified students, the GPA was 3.03. Uh, 3. The dropout rate was 1.4%. Well, uh, you know, for students without certifications, and those with certification is 0.1%. And one more, you know, really interesting um, uh, fact is, uh, you know, the 66% of, I'm sorry, 76% of students without certification graduate, um, whereas the ones with certifications have a 94% graduation rate. So, you know, it's, I, I don't know the reasoning behind it, but it seems that, you know, those who are certified either have more motivation um, or, and probably will be more successful in, in trying to find one of these uh, high, high growth jobs in the future. So um, it's just really interesting in, in that list in the previous slide. Um, again, there, you know, certifications are definitely important in hiring managers um, and it, potentially it has a reasoning to, you know, maybe make a better student uh, per se because they're investing not only time but money into getting certified. <clears throat> Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. <laughs> no, that's good. Edwin, you and I have talked about this before, but one of the things that we've talked about is that sometimes being competent at something and being demonstrably competent at something makes it easier for you to do other things. 
and it makes you right. gives you the confidence to strive in other ways. And one of the cool things about getting a certification, and I actually study um, technical certifications and the value of technical certifications in, ah. in uh, employment, um, the value of those becomes once you've learned to achieve that, it becomes easier to achieve other things. And I think there's a there's a big component about that in in, uh, in grade school and high school. You can do it. It makes it easier to do the next hard thing. I think. Right. No, that's that's good to hear. Thank you. Yep. So. And we're going to talk a little bit about, um, um, I'm going to wrap up and get to some conclusions, but I wanted to give um, Edwin a chance here. Edwin, I'm going to, I'm going to pass you the ball um, and give you a chance to, to talk through, I think, um, some of the components of the, of the Microsoft Office Suite, just so we have that um, laid out. You bet. You know, I, I don't want to try to sales pitch this too much, but essentially, you know, pushing identified Office is, uh, you know, number three skill out there for the high growth, high paying jobs. Um, we recently announced uh, in December at EDUCAUSE that uh, there's something uh, called Student Advantage. It's a program where we provide office for students at no cost. So you have the ability to install office on students' personal machines, uh, whether it's a Mac or a PC uh, or even their mobile devices, and, and have the ability to, um, you know, gain the skills in office. Um, I kind of briefly mentioned Office 365 before, but all these different skills, the ability to collaborate, to do video conferencing, to, to do social enterprise, and, and to share documents, and, and, um, and uh, even communicating through email per se, uh, that is actually a free program that we offer also for educational institutions. It's, again, it's called Office 365 for, for education. Um, some of the big schools that, uh, or, or, you know, places that have been using it, for example, a web, and I'll just mention the ones that have been published. There's a lot more other schools, but um, I'm not going to mention names specifically, but the West Virginia Department of Education, they're, they're deploying, uh, in the middle of deploying Office via Student Advantage to all their students across the state. Georgia Department of Education has 2.1 million users across faculty, staff, and students. And they're starting to deploy Office as well um, across the state. Um, <clears throat> LA uh, Unified School District, um, the reason they've been using this type of technology to, to enhance their students' learning is, um, one, I mean, they're, they're prone to earthquakes, but now with this cloud service, this Office 365, you'd still be able to connect remotely with teachers and staff to keep them appraised of breaking news and other district-wide communications while ensuring robust security and privacy for potentially confidential and sensitive information. We do keep the data uh, within the United States. Um, so, you know, when it comes to privacy and security, that's definitely something of utmost importance to us. And then also the biggest school district um, in the United States uh, recently signed up for Office 365, and they're going to start to deploy Office to their students. Um, so, I mean, there's just a lot of potential here, especially since we're making this, I can't use the word free, so I have to say no cost. But um, you know I, what we're what we're starting to see is schools are taking an advantage of this, making sure that they're providing their students with skills needed in this uh, you know high-paying, high-growth uh, workforce. So um, that's all I had to say about that. Let me go to the next slide. And this basically touches upon again, you know, making sure workforce college college readiness. Um, you know, it, it basically uh, recaps what, what I mentioned in, in the previous slide. But again, you know, if you choose to do something like Office, just know that we have these programs to make sure uh, that not we only enable your students, um, but there's even training programs to help, you know, teachers and students get certified. As, as Cushing was mentioning, you know, certifications help you focus on other stuff. And we have, a, I think, 11 or 12 states across the U.S. who are, you know, using this at a high level in order to certify their students. So if you're really interested in learning more about deploying, you could go to this website, aka.ms um, slash O365 webcast. Sign up today and you'll learn more about the, uh, about the different tools that you can use in the classroom. So I'll hand it back over to Cushing. Thank you so much for that few minutes and I uh, appreciate uh, your time. Thanks very much. Uh, and when I appreciate that. So the, in conclusion, I wanted to talk about um, just the kind of wrapping up, uh, tying back to those mega trends that, that uh, to compete for an increasingly diverse customer base, most enterprises are going to require a diverse customer employee, uh, a, an employee, excuse me, a diverse employee population. They can develop products and effectively communicate with and service those clients. Those same employees must be better equipped to work, reason, and communicate with those diverse employee populations, too, as we heard from Edwin, too. 
and to adjust to the changing relationships with employers. Employees will need to be increasingly self-motivated, self-directed, and able to anticipate needs more quickly than a more paternalistic work culture might have suggested. And to function effectively in increasingly complex business structures, employees must become comfortable with ambiguity, take initiative, and be able to work in a team-based environment, and sometimes in a team-based environment where leadership structures change. To better leverage and address the needs of an expanding mobile customer base, employee, employers are going to be increasingly selecting employees who can consistently demonstrate behaviors and attitudes that reflect the corporate brand promise with only limited in, or infrequent guidance. And to better utilize and benefit from digital commerce and digital content, employees will need to be able to be increasingly flexible to both identify opportunities and respond to market conditions. We could talk a little bit about that the ability to support and utilize IT in the workplace. Many positions will need the capacity to think beyond their specific task or job to the systemic implications of an action or inaction or even failure to act. And while domain knowledge is, is a key for success in any specific occupation, what, what we found is that communication, integration, and presentation skills are at least as valuable and in many occupations more important to success than any specific occupational skill. Well, what this leads us to is kind of some of the, what IDC would call and what, what my, my format brand police say that I will call essential guidance. And it begins with anchoring, sta anchoring standards in the real world. This analysis strongly suggests that a small set of skills are overwhelmingly more in demand for cur current and future occupations and that core skills, especially in communication, integration, and presentation, are overwhelmingly desirable in today's occupations and for those occupations with the highest growth and above salary, above average salary expectations by 2020. For educators, this suggests um, that you might want to consider core skills like SIPs. Whether choosing, when choosing curricular content or objectives, educators should consider from that set of common and core skills that employers will demand of their students after they graduate. This research suggests oral and written communication skills, problem solving, organizational skills, and analytic skills, and strong interpersonal skills will be most relevant well beyond 2020. But with a large number of positions, when while a large number of positions require technical skills of one type or another, there does not appear to be a consistent, broad-based requirement for heavily technical skills in either high growth or high salary positions or occupations overall. On the other hand, many skills benefit from the knowledge of personal productivity applications like we've seen. This suggests that as educators consider how to augment classroom instruction with technologies or to invest in applications that support ongoing achievement, decision makers should consider the value to the common frequently required skills of being proficient with tools that help support things like communication, integration, and presentation. And I would say, when purchasing software for use within the classroom, educators and school district leaders should consider both the current penetration of that software and its future position to ensure that the decisions, that the, that the decisions and the skills are anchored in common or expected requirements. But in the future, I do think that more work needs to be done on this kind of research. We need to confirm and replicate the findings with similar or alternative approaches. We need to monitor um, these kinds of work by testing hypotheses and tracking the applicability of these skills. And then at some point, we need to revise both the curriculum we work with and the hypotheses that I presented based on job growth data, wage info, and required competencies. So that's all I have to say. I've kind of hit, the, hit my time mark. Um, I'm going to pass this back. Um, if there are any questions, we'd love to be able to take uh, several questions from you as we move forward. Thank you, both of you. So we have some questions. Um, first one for either of you, the question is, is Office 365 equivalent to Google Docs? Or is it just... I'm going to leave that to Yep. I'm going to leave that to yep. Edwin, if I could. You bet. No, thank you. I, I did um, just respond in the chat. Basically, you know, Office 365 can be compared to Google Docs, but there's a lot of additional security and privacy uh, privacy features 
as well as integrate really tightly integrated ways to collaborate in, in the ways that the other you know some other products cannot. Um, and it also creates that same experience across all devices. So you're not limited to a specific browser or to a Mac or PC. You can actually have a full version of Office on iPhone, iPad, Android. So say, for example, a teacher is um, uh, you know, assigning homework. Well, the student can go ahead and start typing up the report on the school bus in their iPhone, iPad, or Android, or Mac or PC. Um, and you know, we, we offer additional uh, storage for a lot of the users. For example, one terabyte of space is provided for every single user uh, to use. Um, I see how for how many users. Again, we have a free version of this. Uh, it's it's called A2, and you have unlimited users. You you know, we have some school districts with over a million students plus um, you know teachers and faculty. So this scales very well. Um, and again, I have some great examples of, you know, a lot of state um, department educations using, including West Virginia, Georgia, LAUSD, et cetera. Um, should I continue with the questions in the chat window, or um, did you want to go ahead and, and, you know, go through the list of the other list of questions? Them. They have the email <clears throat> they want to um, follow up after, but I think that was good, a good answer. Um, next question, with the state-of-the-art translation tools that are now available and developing, do you expect that multilingual and bilingual skills will decrease accordingly? Let me, let me start with that one. Um, if, the interesting thing about um, translation is all translation is doing is actually um, kind of essentially transcribing from one language to another. There's a lot of communication that occurs um, through the actual interpersonal skills. Um, I'm a big fan of of uh, Star Trek and love the universal communicator that they have on their chests, you know, that they can, tra universal translators that can, that can uh, um, translate immediately. Or even back in the, in the Douglas Adams days, the babblefish that you stuck in your ear that would translate things. I think that's all very cool. But I, don't think, I think we're a long way away from that. What systems now do is they allow us to just translate the words. Um, but they don't. They can't coach you to the right context. They can't. They can't help you if you were applying a metaphor. They can't help you understand whether that metaphor actually is translatable to the other to the uh, other language. So I think we're still going to need some. Bi we're going to need bilingualism, um, especially because a lot of us are not going to be um, in a position where we can hold up our universal translator and talk to the person across from us. Um, we're going to be experiencing folks in our culture that are not speaking the language we speak or they're not speaking the language we grew up speaking. And so I think we've got, we've got some time to go um, it, for bilingualism to actually take hold um, before we actually going to kind of transcend and go trans-bilingual where we'll end up not needing any language at all. I completely agree with you, Cushing. Um, you know, maybe someone here has seen that uh, real-time translation uh, via Skype, right? So you have little... Um, closed captions with the actual translations, but as, as, as Cushing mentioned, and even that student from UMass Amherst mentioned, there's some colloquialisms which will not translate appropriately. So yes, you still need that ability to, to communicate in that same language, same culture, et cetera, <clears throat> for sure. But you know, in the future, I'm sure the, the, the real-time translation is going to get much smarter and be able to translate all those idioms and colloquialisms. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, next question. Considering the high growth, high paid jobs you've highlighted, what are the most important skills to develop for the upcoming job market and why? Also, do you have any suggestions for training programs which would enhance those skills? Well, geez, uh, I think I'd head back to, the, to one of the slides in the deck and I'm going thumbing through in my paper version of this because I can't break away from, uh, from paper yet. Um, the thing I'd aim at, it really comes back down to the oral and written communication, attention to detail, uh, and, and, a, and an understanding, and it says the customer service focus is the kind of the next um, level. But what customer service means is a, is, a, is a simultaneous empathy with a client, with a, with a person you're talking to, to understand what it is they're after and trying to offer a way to get there. Not, I have a hammer, what can I hit for you, you know? Try to figure out what it is they're looking for. And that requires a mental dexterity um, that is different than an order taker or a parts filler. So I think, now, are there training programs out there? Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of kind of aiming at these skills and say, let's teach you attention to detail, or let's teach you customer service focus. Let's integrate that into the basic curriculum that we have, that ability to understand and have empathy 
uh, and really seek to know what the, what the person you're talking to is trying to get you to understand and work on that. That's a degree of, of uh, mental dexterity that I think we all can use a little bit better of. Um, so are there training programs out there? I see it in classrooms, and Edwin sees it in classrooms all over the country. Um, I don't know that there's a specific thing you should be able to go teach. I certainly don't think you should go take a class in um, oral or written communication. It won't, it won't help very much. It'll only be an hour or five hours or 20 hours worth of, of competence, and it's something we need to work on all the time. Edwin, have you seen anything specific that might, uh, that might aim people at any of these skills? Certainly around Microsoft Office, but about any of these other skills um, anywhere? I, I, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but anything? I actually missed that part of that context. So uh, any skills with Microsoft Office pertaining to, I apologize. Oh, so my, my, the question had been to us, what, what are the most common important skills that we're going to see, and are there any direct training programs out there that, you could, that we could aim um, people towards? And I was thinking that maybe Microsoft Office has got some um, training programs and certification programs that might be relevant to this. You bet. There's actually a lot of free programs. So, for example, there's something called Windows in the Classroom, WIC, W-I-C, uh, where we send um, these trainers, these teachers who also, um, you know, are very specialized in um, office, and they come to your school and, and talk, talk to you about Windows, et cetera. We also have the Microsoft Innovative Educators, um, uh, which helps you, uh, you basically, you know, do a search on that, but we basically help you with lessons plans, et cetera. But if you want to take it a step further, similar to the other states um, where they're providing certifications is that IT Academy program. It's called Microsoft IT Academy, and we really do a good job of providing um, curriculum for, you know, taking your Microsoft official um, courseware and or uh, certification exams. Uh, and I, we've seen a lot of schools across the country deploy that. And again, you know, that, that example in the state of California, I'm sorry, North Carolina, we have Florida. Um, I could pull up a list. We have another eight or, or ten other states here. But uh, it's definitely been great, gaining a lot of traction. And, you know, I think we're really ensuring that these students are very prepared and going to have a competitive edge with the certification over, say, another student who knows office but isn't certified per se. Um, and to Cushing's point, doesn't necessarily mean they're better uh, at office if they have a certification, but they can go ahead and focus on other things. So uh, those are just some of the programs that Microsoft has. Um, <clears throat> you also want to might, you might want to take a look at um, Microsoft's education website. I think it's Microsoft.com slash education. I'll post this in the window just to have you all copy the links. You don't have to write it down quickly. Um, but I'll post them on the links. A lot of them are free. The IT Academy is a small fee, but per school. So um, you want to take a look at all those resources, and I'll post that again in the chat window shortly. Thank you. There's time for just about two more questions. Edwin, should school districts teach or encourage students to use social media channels, such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, et cetera? That's a really good question. I'm not specifically have an expertise in that. However, um, I am on the Massachusetts uh, Department of Education, uh, one of the boards on technology advisory councils. And what we were trying to create is a, you know, how to use or, or how to allow social networks and internet and, and internet use in the classroom. You know, where does it actually provide some value? So just saying, yeah, you should be able to open it up to, you know, say LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. You have to take it a step further, understand, you know, how these students can use it effectively. Um, there is a, uh, a part of Office 365, it's, it's free, it's called Yammer for Enterprise. And Yammer was a social enterprise network where um, <clears throat> employees, I'm sorry, where companies uh, have been using social in order to really do a good job of communicating better with their employees. Schools started rolling this out, um, you know, this Yammer for Enterprise, such that they can have, you know, open conversations in a social manner. You could like things, you can hashtag it, but it's all controlled within your school district or your company. So it's not like a public website, say like Facebook or LinkedIn, where there's really no control that the school district has. But Yammer Enterprise, because it is part of Office 365, gives administrators the ability to restrict certain things um, as, as, as well. So uh, that's, that's the way we have um, enabled um, um, social enterprise uh, for the classroom is, again, through Yammer Enterprise. 
and I have a, I have a slightly more philosophical uh, view yeah, on this. Um, where I would come at this is to think that yes, um, schools and school districts should, at some in some way, encourage students to use these kinds of tools because they're going to be using these tools. And where else should they be? Pr should be practiced and given guidance and given the ex and the and a protected and nurtured environment so that they can learn what the mistakes are that can be made and learn how to how in a in a more protected environment. So I think pro prohibiting or preventing or not using these kinds of tools and then kind of setting them free after graduation just doesn't prepare our students for the kinds of worlds they live in. Now, are there ways to use it badly? Absolutely. And should we be using them? Should we try to avoid those? Absolutely. But I don't think um, I don't think sheltering the kids from these things uh, and expecting them to learn it on their own or trying to um, having the schools and school districts or even classrooms hide from the from the fact that kids are using Twitter and Facebook um, or Instagram or Tumblr or whatever. We need to teach them the digital digital literacy um, and the social literacy that they need in order to both protect themselves and to effectively take advantage of these tools. And that you can't do by hiding from them. Great answer. Before we conclude, is there anything else either of you would like to add which wasn't covered? No, thank you. I think All this right. has been very well, helpful. Thanks for pushing in, Edwin. With that, we will conclude this afternoon's webinar. I'd like to thank you all for attending. If we didn't get to your questions, you can tweet or email your questions to our speakers using the Twitter handles you see on screen. And for those of you who are looking to receive certificates of attendance, please keep an eye out for our follow-up email with a downloadable PDF. Thank you, and see you next time.